Well, financing our correction systems has always been a challenge. In the wake of Measure 5, this challenge has become even more daunting. However, Frank Hall, director of the Oregon State Department of Corrections, believes that even with funding at pre-Measure 5 levels, it is clear that Oregon cannot build its way out of the crime problem. He is with us today to discuss why he believes the state's budget's cutbacks provide an opportunity for the Corrections Department to redefine its public mission with an emphasis on rehabilitation and community reintegration for offenders. Frank Hall was appointed to the head of the Department of Corrections last spring by Governor Barbara Roberts. She described him as a real find for Oregon. She said, I was looking for someone who could bring new ideas to the Department of Corrections. Well, Frank Hall has over 25 years of experience working in corrections departments across the country. He has served in a variety of correction positions in North Carolina, Massachusetts, New York, Maryland, and California. And as we were talking here today, he thinks Oregon is a great place to be. Most recently, he served as the first director of the Santa Clara County Department of Corrections. There, he implemented community correction programs for approximately 1,000 inmates who otherwise would have been incarcerated and developed a direct supervision detection facility that has become a training resource model across the nation. Please join me in welcoming Frank Hall to the City Club. Hearing the discussion of parking today um, made me realize I'd probably arrived on the right day. Um, having come here yesterday for a meeting at City Hall with the mayor, who, by the way, if she had heard this resume, or when I told her about my job experiences around the country and described each of the places I'd been and where I'd been responsible for various correction systems around the United States, she, her comment on all of that was kind of a blunt, uh, well, couldn't you keep a job? <laughs> well, I can say that um, hearing Dave talk about the parking issue also reminded me of the six years I spent in Massachusetts, in Boston. I was the director of the Department of Correction in Massachusetts for a number of years, and, and for any of you who are interested, no, I did not know Willie Horton, uh, because I'm always asked that question, and I'd like to answer it up front. <laughs> and I didn't sign his furlough. But um, Boston had a unique sort of solution to the parking problem. There were, I think, about uh, 250,000 cars in the city, in the surrounding area, and I think there were about 150,000 parking places. And that's the way they kept it. And most of the time, the other 100,000 cars were riding around the city of Boston, uh, crashing into the other cars that were coming into the city of Boston. But that's the way they solved their parking problem. I'm struck by the fact that um, in Oregon, probably more so than most places I've ever been, there's kind of a willingness on the part of the citizens of this state to tackle problems, uh, to deal with issues, uh, to get on top of uh, problems before they overwhelm uh, those of us who live here. I'm struck by the fact that uh, there's a willingness to sit down and, and that people are willing to listen uh, to another perspective. And having spent several years in Boston and several years in New York, uh, several years in Washington, uh, several years in Maryland and a few other places, uh, I think you can probably understand why I appreciate this. Uh, I think people have a tendency in a lot of those places to do a lot of talking and they're quick to take a position on an issue, uh, but they're not uh, very quick to listen. And they're not very quick to see if they can find the solution. Uh, you are rather unique, I think, and I think the state is rather unique. And although the things that are going on in Salem today may belie something else, uh, I don't think that's going to be the long run uh, future of this state. I think there's going to be a willingness uh, before July 1st, at least I hope before July 1st, uh, to come to terms with Ballot Measure 5 and come to terms with some of the other realities that, uh, that, that have uh, essentially hit all of us uh, during this last, uh, last several months. I do think that um, this place is unique in the sense that when I first arrived and I went into my office and I was trying to get organized and I was looking around and trying to figure out where everything went and turned on all the gadgets all the telephones and radios and made certain the chair was at the right height. And um, I looked around and, and had a very busy day meeting a number of my staff, of, uh, some of whom are here today. Uh, Lise Clausen is my Deputy Commissioner for Community Corrections, does a real outstanding job for us and 
helps me up in the legislature trying to get our program uh, through this year. And John Foote is also here, the Inspector General for the Department. Uh, John has done an excellent job is, is to try to keep us out of trouble as, a, as an agency and as a public agency. He's also done an outstanding job in interdicting the drugs uh, that traditionally come into correctional institutions and have traditionally been a cause of violence and, and lots of other problems that exist in corrections. But after I finished the day, I, I, um, I was sitting in my office, it was about uh, 5 o'clock, and an inmate walked in because we have some inmates working in the building there. These are minimum security people who help out with some of the chores. And um, he wanted to know if, uh, if I had any recyclables. And I thought for a minute, and I re-what? Do you have any recyclables? And after he asked me about the third time, it finally occurred to me that he wanted recyclables and that this was the way you do business in this state. <laughs> so, you know, I knew I was in Oregon, and uh, I was happy to be here. And it also sort of told me something else, uh, because there's something else that became very apparent in sort of traveling around the system, uh, that in spite of what sometimes you hear uh, about the uh, quality of corrections in this state, and I know that there's a lot of history here, and a lot of things have happened in this system over the last many years, the reality of it is, you know, having worked in lots of other places over the last 25 years, and having uh, worked in a lot of other situations, and I can't think of anything that I haven't personally uh, confronted at one time or the other, whether it be a riot or a fire or a shootout or, or a hostage situation I, there, or a, a, a crowd of a thousand people who don't want you to open a correctional institution in their neighborhood. Uh, the fact of it is, I think this is a pretty impressive uh, place to be. And I think the quality of the staff that work in this system um, are really second to none. Uh, I've been struck by the commitment and I've also been struck by the experience that the staff have, and, I, and I'm, I'm grateful for it. As I tell my staff, now that I'm over 50, I'm very grateful for the gray hair. Uh, because I look around and I see people dealing with inmates, and I see people dealing with very difficult situations in a way that tells me that they've got experience and that they know how to deal with people, uh, they know how to run a humane system, a clean system, a safe system, and that they understand that you have to be able to do the basics if you're going to be effective, and that we really can't talk about corrections reform, or we can't talk about reducing recidivism, or we can't talk about any of those things that we need to be doing as a state agency if we can't keep people safe. And I'm talking about the staff safe and the inmate safe. And you do that better in this state than any state I've ever been in. And I've visited prisons all over the United States. And Tamara Holden is here and she works, has worked in the Utah correctional system and, and has a lot of experience in institutions and I think she would second uh, that statement. I've been very impressed with the quality of the, of the system and the quality of the people that work in this system. We have something else in this state which is very exciting, and I think we may have lost sight of the value of this uh, uh, particular piece of legislation, but in 1977, uh, the legislature had the foresight and the leadership of the state had the foresight to develop a Community Corrections Act. And in that, when that law was passed in 77, uh, the state developed a concept of uh, community corrections and the development of local community corrections agencies around the state of Oregon. And you have one right here in Multnomah County, uh, headed by Tamara Holden. And there are uh, community corrections agencies in every county in this state. And the partnership that exists between the state uh, correctional system and the local correction system and the partnership that we have uh, with the sheriffs and other people responsible for running the jails in this state really gives us a correction system. And there's more thought as to how this system works and how an adjustment in one part of the system affects the other than any place that I've ever been. And a, more, and a, a willingness on the part of the people that have responsibility uh, to consider what the impact of some of the changes would be on the entire uh, correction system. I think that what we have uh, in 1993 is a unique uh, and difficult uh, situation and also I think a unique opportunity. Uh, those of you who were around in 1988 know that the governor at that time, Neil Goldsmith, uh, developed a very extensive uh, report. Uh, it was the governor's task force report on corrections uh, that recommended that the state build and open 3,000 new corrections beds. And that was done. Uh, those beds were opened on time, those beds were opened under budget, and those beds were, are now operational and are now part of the system. And also in 1989, the state instituted sentencing guidelines which meant, in effect, that if you go before a judge and you're found guilty of a crime and you get five years, 
that you do five years. And I think what's, you know, what I find when I travel around the state is there's still a perception out there, and sometimes you find it uh, with, with, with members of the local uh, media, there's still a perception that if you get five years or you get ten years in Oregon, you're going to go down there and, and you're going to go to Salem or some other place in the state, and you're going to do a year, and then you're going to be back on the street. And that is not true. And if people tell you that, that's, they're not giving you the truth. That is not the reality today. It was the reality in the state a few years ago. But with the opening of 3,000 new prison beds, you do your time in the state. And that's not true in, in much of the rest of the country. And not true in Florida. It's not been true in Oklahoma. It's not been true in a number of other states. But it is true in the state of Oregon. You do your time. I think the other thing that the governor's task force did in 1988, and it's important to understand the history so people don't think that we're going off in a whole different direction. And I don't, because I know what you've experienced in this particular area of public safety, it seems to be always a shifting of the wind. You know, uh, back in the 60s, we were moving one direction. In the 70s, we moved in another. In the 80s, we moved back toward the center. And the 90s, we moving, were moving again somewhere else. And everyone always has a new vision and a new idea of what we ought to be doing. Well, we're not doing that here. You know, I think the work that that task force did in 1988 was extremely impressive work. And what they did was outline what the system should look like and where we should be going as a department. And I'm impressed with what they recommended. But in addition to the 3,000 beds that were recommended, they were also, there was also a recommendation that we develop the community programs at the local level. And that we look beyond the traditional parole and probation supervision where you call on an individual maybe two or three times a month, depending on the level of supervision. But look beyond the traditional supervision of people on parole, and that means after they've come out of prison or on probation, which means they're serving their sentence in the community rather than going to prison, that we look at another approach and that we develop some programs at the local level to really try to not only deal with criminality and hold offenders accountable, but also to deal with the reality that if you're going to change anything, and if you're going to make the system more effective, and if you're going to reduce recidivism, and I'm one of those few people in this world that believe we can reduce recidivism and have had the experience of reducing recidivism, then you've got to change the offender. So we built the 3,000 beds. Uh, we opened the 3,000 beds. We instituted sentencing guidelines. But the question uh, that all of us are asking, all of us who work in corrections, all of us who work in local corrections and state corrections, and the question the governor is asking and members of the legislature are asking and members of the Citizens Crime Commission are asking and the Oregon Council of Crime and Delinquency, I see Tom English back there, and Patrick Donaldson of the Crime Commission, the questions everyone is asking me and asking our department, now that you've got the beds, you know, what about the rest of it? What are you supposed to do with offenders? You know, how do you achieve real public safety? Because putting a person in a prison bed for a few months or a few years in some cases isn't necessarily going to bring about public safety. We have to affect some change in the offender if we want to have real public safety. Now, I want to please understand that I don't want anyone to have the illusion that after 30 years in this business that I think I can rehabilitate and that my staff and Tamara's staff and others of us can rehabilitate everyone uh, for whom we're responsible. We have 6,500 people in the state prisons. We have, th more importantly, for your, you need to know because you're more likely to run into some of these people this afternoon, there are 35,000 people on the street that are, un that are the responsibility of the Department of Correction and your local Department of Correction. And I certainly do not think that I can rehabilitate or any of us can rehabilitate all of those individuals. And I have some people that we deal with that when I go into the institutions, which I do on a regular basis, and I come eye to eye with some of these people, I'm thinking, boy, am I glad you're here. And I'm glad you're not outside. And I hope you're going to be here for a while. Because, you know, there are some people for whom I have no program. There are some people for whom I have no knowledge. I have no science. I, have, I don't know how to change some individuals that we're responsible for. But there are a large number of people with whom we deal who can be changed. And there's an increasing body of evidence and it's real exciting to see a body of evidence support some things that we know from our own personal experience in working with inmates. There's a lot of evidence now that rehabilitation can work, that programs can work, that alcohol and drug programs can reduce criminality, 
they can reduce the rearrest, they can reduce they can reduce the number of people coming back into corrections. There's lots of evidence that if you transition people from prison back to the street, rather than just throw them onto the street on a one with one day's notice, that you can increase that person's chance of succeeding, increase that person's chance of staying out of trouble. So with that increasing body of evidence, then the question is, what are we doing? And the question you should ask me is not only what about the 6,500 people that are in that prison system, and I assure you if one of them gets out tonight, you're going to hold me very accountable uh, for what happens, as I found out about a year ago. Uh, you're going to hold me very accountable if someone slips through the wire or goes over the razor ribbon wire or somehow gets out of those facilities. And yet, please remember that there are another 35,000 on the street, and about 13,000 of them are right within a few miles of this building. There are 13,000 people, and plus there's some at least 13,000 people that we're responsible for with a local corrections agency that are on parole and probation right here in Multnomah County. And then when you include the tri-county area, each year, just think about this, about 3,000 people come out of our correctional institutions right back to your community. You know, they become your neighbors, they become people you see on the street, they're back in the community. And let me tell you how we release them so you'll know what a good job we're doing. An inmate is at Eastern Oregon Correctional Institution in Pendleton, small community, about 10,000 people, uh, very dependent on the correctional institution. Uh, that was what I call economic development uh, when they opened that facility there a few years ago. The inmate comes up to the last day of his sentence and he gets a bus ticket, 30 or 40 dollars, some clothes if he doesn't have any, and he gets the name of a parole officer here in Multnomah County that he's supposed to call when he gets to Multnomah County. Now I go out and talk to citizens all over the state and I even listen to some and what I find <laughs> and what I find is that the perception is that we somehow bring them out into the community then they're cuffed you know and that somehow we bring them out with their hands behind them and they're cuffed and then we sort of we sort of live with them for the first few months after they get out of prison and that's that's so called you know that's the so called supervision that's not real folks that's not what happens and 3000 people a year are put back in your streets it's not they're being released early they're not being released early from prison they're not being released because of overcrowding we're, cuz we're actually at this moment not overcrowded i mean we're close but we're not quite there they're being released because they've done all their time. They've done their sentence. They've done, whether it's five years, 10 years, 20 years, or three months, or whatever, they've done their time and they're back on the street. Somehow you don't hold me accountable for whether I did a good job with those folks. You don't hold me accountable if I solved an alcohol or drug problem. You don't hold me accountable if I took a sex offender and put him in sex, a sex treatment program, and they are sex treatment programs. You don't hold me accountable for whether I got someone to the point where they can read and write or maybe even pass some high school tests and get the equivalent of a, a, a high school education so they can find a job when they get out. But you hold me very accountable for what's going on in those institutions every day. Somehow, everybody's got to get the notion that public safety isn't just the institutions, it's also what goes on in the street and what goes on in the community. And we're not there yet, but we're gonna get there. And the strategy of the department in the middle of ballot measure five and I, I said to a group the other day, if you think they're going to cut the guts out of the mental health program and the programs for the mentally retarded, and they're going to cut education, as they're doing right here in Portland, and let me tell you, you close all the alternative schools in the city of Portland, that will have more effect on the crime rate than closing of a correctional institution. I, I, most of you probably know that. But if you don't think, or you think that somehow, you know, we're going to be responsible for everything that happens. Let me, let me just explain where we are. Ballot Measure 5 is a reality. You can't cut mental health, you can't cut education, you can't cut programs for the mentally retarded, and you can't do all the other damage that we're doing to this state without asking corrections to take a piece of that. And as a director, I don't want to lose a single bed, I don't want to lose a single staff person, but I'm telling you, as I stand here today, I have 200 fewer people than I did a year ago to do the job that you hold me responsible for doing. And when this budget is finished, we'll probably have 600 fewer beds in this correction system, and we'll probably have anywhere from 50 to 60, maybe 70 
uh, fewer parole and probation officers because the budget is a reality. And somehow in the middle of all this, we have to develop a strategy and there has to be a plan because if we sit here and do nothing, if we just let things stay exactly as they are, if we don't try to have an impact, then things will only get worse. And the numbers coming in will only increase. And you're going to have to spend not only everything you're spending now, but another $30 million to take another 1,000 people into the system. So the strategy is a simple one. We're going to try to impact on people in the institutions. You know, we're going to institute boot camp programs. We're going to institute drug and alcohol programs. We're going to institute literacy programs. We're going to do some things that we think, based on some evidence that we have, uh, might have some impact on what people do in the future. The other part of that is we're going to try to develop a more effective way of transitioning people back into the community. So instead of taking people out of Eastern Oregon, and there are people coming today, I mean literally, there are people on a bus today with the name of their parole officer in their pocket that are on the way back to Portland. Some of them have mental health problems, which is not a big surprise to some of you. Um, they're on the way back here. Instead of doing that, we're developing a program and we're starting now. We're not waiting until the end of the budget or until the legislature decides well, what we're going to do. We're working with Tamara's staff. We're working with other people throughout the state so we can have a transition program, at least a 60-day program, for people that are coming out of the institution and back into the community. So, and I think that will impact on the number of people that are failing on parole and it's, it's an unacceptable number of people that are failing uh, today on parole. And I think it will impact on that number. The other thing we're doing is trying to impact on the people that are on probation. Now, let me tell you how it works in the state. We have sentencing guidelines, which means when a judge passes a sentence, he has a grid. And if you fall under a line on this grid, that means you get probation, which means instead of going to a state correctional facility, you get maybe some local jail time and you get time on probation. In other words, you'll be under probation supervision in the community. What's happening currently and why we're so concerned and why, it, why we consider it to be a crisis is that 82 percent of all the admissions into the department last year were people that failed on probation and failed on parole. So they failed when they came out of the system and the ones that were in the community that didn't come in the system in the first instance, they're also failing. Now when 82 percent of our admissions, I mean, when I told this to my colleagues in other parts of the country, they didn't believe it. And they said, well, how long are they getting when they come back in? I mean, if they come back in for a technical violation, in other words, they didn't commit a new crime, but they violated the terms of their parole or probation, how much time are they getting? And I said, well, about four months if they're on parole and about eight months if they're on probation. 82% of the people coming into the system. And we've designed a program and we're seeking legislative authority to implement a program of structured, uh, what we call structured guidelines or structured sanctions for people on probation. So the probation officer, when he has a problem with a particular individual in the community, doesn't have to wait till that person keeps doing so many things that they then nail them and send them back to prison. He will have some sanctions available to him that he can use immediately. Maybe two days in jail, maybe five days in a restitution center, maybe he sends the person home and hooks them up to an electronic monitor so they can't go anywhere except maybe to work or to some therapeutic uh, program, an alcohol or drug program. But the idea is to hold people accountable. In some cases, we're going to have people report every day to a day reporting center. And the governors put money in the budget to implement those programs. So they have to be somewhere every day. They have to have an itinerary. They have to be in a drug and alcohol program. They have to be looking for a job. Instead of just letting people roam the countryside and hoping you're going to run into them a couple of times a month. The fact is, too, we have a lot of people that we don't even supervise because we don't have the staff to supervise. And they basically fill out a form and send it to us once a month. So we're talking about trying to develop some accountability and understand that everything that's been studied about this business, and in spite of what you may hear and what you may read, says that punishment alone will not deter people from criminal activity. I, I don't know why we didn't, I thought we figured this out. But now we have research that tells us this. And that the sanction could be effective, but the sanction won't be effective not unless you're also doing something else, and that is providing a program where you're trying to change the behavior. And that's what we're about, and that's what we're going to try to do uh, with people on probation. I think, as I pointed out, that it's difficult to try to go out to the community and say, 
these are the things that need to be done when I know you're confronted with lots of other issues. Uh, and certainly, if you're not concerned about the education system, uh, you should be. And if you're not concerned about other things in this community, you, clearly you need to be. But the reality of it is, I think corrections is, is so much a, 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 such a clear responsibility of government. You know, the protection of, its, of citizens are the first responsibility of any government, state, local, or federal government. And I think we take that responsibility very seriously. But the question is, and I think Chief Potter has done this better than almost anyone, you know, why do we keep pretending as if we're doing this on our own or that we can somehow do this by ourselves? Uh, I don't quite understand. I think for years uh, we wanted to solve every problem and we wanted to be able to take on anything and tell the world how tough we were and how capable we were. We could solve anything, do anything. The fact of it is, you know, we found out uh, we're overwhelmed also. And, you know, we need, as the police do, you know, because your, your quality of your life in your community, the quality of and whether your crime rate depends not only on, on uniform police officers, it also it depends on the citizens. You know, citizens have to be involved. Citizens have to contribute. Citizens have to be part of it. Well, the correction system is no different. And we need citizens as volunteers. Uh, we need citizens as mentors, volunteers in institutions. We need citizens who will volunteer to work with inmates in the community, since 35,000 of them are in the community. We need people that will offer an ex-offender an opportunity to work. And our people do want to work. I mean, if anyone tells you inmates don't want to work, it's not true. Inmates do want to work. And if some of you would come in and open, instead of letting those businesses go to, to the Chinese prison system or to Bangladesh or, or to some offshore um, possibility, if we could employ some of the, those industries right here in Oregon in our prison system, we, we're set up by law that we can actually open up a correctional industry right in the prison system and keep the jobs here in Oregon. And then we can charge the inmate for room and board. And we need those opportunities for people. And I can tell you they'll line up at the door for the opportunity to work. So we've got to get away from this notion, those of us in the profession, and I know I, I take full responsibility because I think we're part of the problem, that uh, somehow we're supposed to do this on our own. Uh, we have got to get the community involved, and we've got to do a better job of telling the community what is reality and what isn't. And I think so much of what we've said in this sort of crime hype over the last 25 years has misled our citizens as to what the real problems are and what really needs to be done. And a perfect example of this is in the whole war on drugs. And I don't need to tell any of you in this room that the war on drugs has not been a great success uh, that, that we've engaged in in law enforcement and corrections. And somehow we've spent millions of dollars to cut the supply of drugs coming into the country why didn't we cut the demand? The supply keeps coming in, and when you know when you don't get it from Peru and Ecuador, guess where you get it from? Somebody's garage where they make methamphetamine. Or guess where they get it from? In the woods of Oregon, in California. They cut the marijuana coming into California about 5% by very vigorous and very expensive law enforcement effort in the last few years. Guess what happened? The local production went up 5% and took care of the demand. And guess what? The local stuff was much better than the stuff they were bringing in from overseas. And it was about three times more potent. So let's get our priorities straight. Let's deal with the demand side. And let's deal with people in a more effective way in the community. And let's try to get our citizens involved. And let's quit pretending that we, as the experts, somehow have all the answers. Because I can tell you, we do not. But we have learned some things. And we have made some progress. And we have, there is some hope. You know, this is not a dead end. There is hope. And the great thing about living in a place like Oregon is that I think we have an opportunity uh, to maintain what is, I think, a great quality of life. And we have an opportunity to maintain strong communities and safe communities. And we have an opportunity to uh, help our citizens in a positive way. Uh, we haven't yet been overwhelmed. And with your help, uh, I think we can do some very positive things, and we can bring about some real changes in the way we do business in the criminal justice system. Thank you very much. Thanks, Frank. Our first question comes from Andrew Wheeler, followed by one from the floor, and then I would welcome everyone to go to the microphone. Andrew? Uh, Mr. Hall, uh, Frank. How many of the inmates were abused as children 
and how does that relate to their antisocial behavior? Are those inmates among the most difficult to change? Clearly, all the, all the data tells us that uh, the people that we deal with in the correction system, uh, a high percentage of, or, or a substantial percentage, I won't say a high percentage of people were abused as, as children, either sexual abuse or physical abuse or both. Uh, but, but you need to know that, uh, in fact, we just had this discussion yesterday. I had a, an, a national expert who does work, in working, works with sex offenders in our department. He's a, an independent uh, contractor who comes in and provides uh, treatment services in, within our department. He pointed out yesterday that uh, there isn't the correlation that people assume between being a victim of sexual abuse and becoming a sexual abuser. You know, about 25 percent of sexual abusers were abused as children, but this, this assumption we've made all along that everybody that's a sex abuser is somehow was also a victim of sexual abuse isn't necessarily true. And again, the, the data is beginning to, uh, to, to, to tell us some things that perhaps we didn't know uh, previously in this particular area. My name is Brad Stanford. You spoke of your prison industries program, and our committee has been looking at that a bit. Uh, and we learned that the state house had passed legislation abolishing the the industry's board of directors. My question is, what was your department's position on that, and why? Well, the the abolishment of the board of directors was is is more a matter of trying to begin to cut down on the numbers of, of citizens' bodies and various other organizations that have been established uh, over the years in the state. There's been sort of proliferation of, 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 um, of organizations over time, and it's gotten a little bit out of hand. And the governor had said we should reduce the number, it would be more cost effective, and, and, would, and that we have a lot of commissions and a lot of agencies out there that really no longer have a useful role to play. What we've done is suggested that our our board of directors or our advisory board could be abolished, but we in turn would set up a departmental board that would be advisory to the director and to the department and to our director of industries, and that's what we propose to do. And what I would propose to do is to broaden that board because I think we need more representatives of business community and I think we need more labor representatives if we're going to do an effective job of trying to attract uh, more people, uh, more business people into, into setting up businesses within the, within the correction system. So we hope to broaden it. Uh, but it will be somewhat different. It will be advisory and it will be appointed by the uh, director rather than be a uh, gubernatorial appointment. We seem to have uh, criminalized mental illness in this state and in, in the country. And I'm wondering how you address the problem of the, the seriously mentally ill, not the, just the antisocial but the schizophrenic and so on that are in the prisons. Well, as I've heard the uh, director of mental health in the state say some, it's very difficult to tell the difference between those people sometimes in the mental health facilities getting treatment and, and people that have mental health problems in the correction system. And traditionally over the years, I could probably point to at least 15 percent of our population that have serious uh, mental health problems. We provide mental health services within the system. Uh, we do it uh, with the Department of Mental Health providing the service because our feeling is they're the experts in mental health. They should be in here dealing with people. They're still in a corrections environment, and they're still in a secure environment, but we think the mental health people are the appropriate people to do it. My, my concern in the whole mental health area, and it's an area in which I've had a longstanding interest, is that if the state budget continues to go in the direction that it probably will go, that I think what will happen locally is that you will lose resources to fund local mental health programs. Those people then tend to be criminalized. They st stamp a criminal justice label on them, and they slip into the jail which, by the way, you need to support your jail levy. Uh, that's absolutely important. I mean, I, somebody said, what should we do uh, about some of these problems? You could start by supporting your local sheriff, Bob Skipper, and, and pass the jail levy, because it doesn't expand the jail, but they need that money to support those jail beds that they need in this, uh, in this county. But what happens is those people slide into the jail system. Some ultimately slide into the state correction system. And of course, what happens is then the sheriff and then the Department of Correction find themselves in a position where they have to provide mental health services because you have no choice. You've got the problem. You've got to deal with it. But we're, we're, move, we're going to move in that direction if the budget becomes a reality, I think. Not in some big dramatic shift, but it's going to come over time. Go ahead, Pauline. You first. Ladies first. Thank you, Dan. 
I'm Pauline Anderson, member of the City Club. I am delighted that you're as interested as you are in inter intermediate sanctions because uh, we can't afford any more prison beds. As a matter of fact, we probably can't afford the ones we have. I'm wondering, though, um, intermediate sanctions are not free. Uh, where in this uh, cutting mode that the state is in are you going to find the funds to uh, to fund intermediate sanctions, such as the day reporting and more intensive supervision of those who uh, probably would not go back to prison. Are you going to take it out of your prison budget? Yeah, I, I think you've you've touched on for for su that you've touched on an issue that for me has been probably the most difficult since I've been here. I mean, aside from some of the day-to-day -day issues that deal with in this business, this has been I think one of our most difficult decisions. Basically, in the governor's budget. And this was with lengthy discussion with the governor and the governor's staff and with people that we work with at the local level as well as people in the state. We made a decision that we need to shift some resources uh, over to community corrections and over to the intermediate sanctions. And it'd be very easy to have done these things and just added them on. You know, if I just gone in and said, give me everything I had last year and I want to add on $25 million for community corrections, everybody would have said, oh, that's wonderful, except there's no money. So what we did was face, uh, and this was very tough. I mean, this was personally very tough for, the, for my staff because it basically means we, we've got to say that we're going to give up something in order to get something we think is absolutely critical if this system is going to succeed and if we're not going to get overwhelmed in the future. So we've given up some beds on the institutional side, although my guess is the legislature will want to put some of those beds back. I mean, I, I feel that, that that's, you know, in the discussions I've had in Salem, I think that's the thinking. But we've asked, and the governor put in the budget, $20 million to do programs at the local level. And some of that was also resulting in a, in a shift in the way we do probation and parole, whereby instead of trying to supervise people forever, we would supervise people intensely for the first few months after they come out of the system. And, instead of, and then after that, if they're successful, we would cut them off and say that's the end of it. And we would lose some parole and probation staff, which is also very difficult for us at this juncture. Uh, it's very difficult to, to, do, to make any of those kinds of decisions, but I think we faced up to the reality and said we've got to have those intermediate sanctions and we've got to be able to affect some change in those community programs if we're going to impact on the system in, in a positive way, have you know, a positive impact on the overall system. So that's, those are the choices we made and the money is in the budget. Now the question is, of course, where will it be July 1st, but the money is in the budget as it stands. Uh, <clears throat> Dan Goldie. Um, as a former director of economic development for the state, I was very interested in hearing you relate the corrections problem to mental health education. But there's another area, and it comes up in two ways. One, when you release people from the institutions, what help do you give them, if any, to get jobs when they get back in, out in the community? Because if they're tossed out and they have no means of earning a living, it's very easy to go back to stealing for a living or doing something. And the other related question to it is, when you do your budget planning for how many beds you need in the correction system, are you taking into account the fact that we're looking at the prospect of a whole series of community resource-based industry closures that are going to create dead ends, high unemployment in rural communities around this state and I'm sure that that type of unemployment produces more problems for the corrections program. Yeah, I would love to tell you that we've done some very sophisticated analysis of, 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 the, of those kinds of trends in terms of the workforce. Uh, we haven't. And I think the quality of the workforce, which has always been one of the things that's always attracted people to the state, uh, and one of the things that may be endangered in, in the future, I mean, that certainly has a lot to do with the economic future of this state. And you know much more about that, of course, than I do. Um, we are just beginning to get a handle on the jobs issue and just beginning to develop with this community corrections program some resources to work on the jobs part of the picture. Because I agree with you, if you just send somebody out and you find a place for them to stay and they don't have a job, I mean, I mean, I don't, you don't need to tell people what the theory is. I mean, people figure it out real fast what happens. And you know, just when I look at the facility we have here in Portland, the Columbia River Correctional Facility, the people that come through that facility that are coming back to the city, we need 170 new jobs a month to make that program work. 
And we're finding this to be one of the most difficult things that we're faced with. And Tamar and I and her staff and my staff are working now and trying to develop some programs to get people working. And, and again, we're not always looking for the ideal situation, but we certainly want to get people employed. And we'd like to get them employed before they actually leave, the, you know, leave, our, you know, leave our responsibility and are out there on their own. Uh, that would be the ideal situation. That's the thing we're working toward. Yes. Tom Stanwood, uh, city club member. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, several states uh, are experimenting with, the, with private contractors in the running of prisons. And in view of the uh, fiscal and budget constraints that have been imposed upon us by Measure 5, is this an option for us here in Oregon? I don't think at this point it's a, it's a serious option. We, we, have, we do contract out certain services. And if we can do it more efficiently and we can do it more effectively, and we can save some money, then we do it. And we've done it in the areas of food service. We've done it in medical, the medical area. Uh, we've done it in some, uh, uh, some areas of um, uh, where we, you know, the design of facilities, maintenance of facilities, we've done some contracting out. And I'm certainly a believer that we ought to use every mechanism that's available to us. There have been some studies that are not particularly conclusive in this area. I think Virginia just did a, real, a very extensive study and basically came to the conclusion that in the final analysis, they could run it better than a private contractor, but I don't want you to think I don't want you to think that that would be my final position on that. I, th I certainly think there are some programs could be run uh, by a private sector organization, and I certainly would never rule that out as a, as a possibility. And sometimes I think we're too quick to sort of have knee-jerk reactions to proposals like that. But I think there's some possibilities, and, and I certainly would keep an open mind on it. One more question, okay? Uh, Judith Armada, I wanted to go back to something you said earlier about the um, intensive probation for a short period of time. And I wanted to ask specifically about sex offenders, because that's an area where we're hearing more that longer term pro uh, supervision is really necessary. Uh, what sorts of safety provisions are being made for that? Are you making distinctions in who will be uh, qualifying for a short term intensive probation? Yeah, and we're really making a distinction. And what we're saying is that even even if we reduce the time under supervision because of the because of ballot measure five, we will not reduce under any or under any circumstances the time under supervision for sex offenders. I do believe they need to be supervised for longer periods of time. Keep in mind that their sex offenders are not all one group. I mean, and you know that, but but you know we've got certain kinds of sex offenders that respond to certain kinds of treatment, and then others that may not respond to anything. But clearly, it's you know they're different people depending on the type of offense and the history and lots of other things, but I think longer term supervision is critical and I also think a much more intensive level of supervision. And we even use polygraph exams. I mean, some people sort of cringe when I say that, but we do polygraph exams in our, in our parole supervision of sex offenders and I think it's been very effective. Not so much what you find out when they're on the polygraph, but what they tell you when they know you're gonna be hooked, when they know they're gonna be hooked to the polygraph. But I know it sounds very intrusive, but this is an area where I think we need much more intense effort and we need a lot more knowledge than we have today. Uh, I find that this area, there's tremendous interest but also tremendous ignorance in terms of uh, what needs to be done and what can be done and what, what's effective. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. Frank, thanks very much for being with us today. I would have to agree with uh, Governor Roberts that Frank Hall is a real find for Oregon. We are adjourned.